much. Hi everybody, I'm Hannah Porter. And I'm a playwright also, and I'm also a mentor. Um, and this is my dear friend, Eric, Erica. Uh, and I, I first thought that we might briefly talk about just how we met, because it's a neat sort of story about people finding each other here. Uh, I came here when I was 23. I knew I wanted to put on plays. I didn't really know how to. And I went to a place and I took a class, which is something that's a really wonderful thing to do once you're out of college. You can go and you can take a class and it doesn't cost a lot. Uh, and Erica was my TA. And you were, you had started Russian Transport in our class. And we read a very, very early draft of that. And I think I asked you if you wanted a coffee with me sometime and talk about plays. And then, you know, this kind of friendship grew out of that. So um, that's just a plug to once you're out of school and once you're out of college to keep on uh, finding, you know, it's easy to, to go and show up to a play, but it's, it's harder sometimes to really meet someone and connect to them as we find, like, our own peer group here. Uh, so I would just love it if you could tell us a little bit about your background to start and then lead into how that turned into Russian transport in its own special way. Um, well, I'm from here. I'm from Brooklyn. And I, yeah, did I get a little woo <laughs> um, And I went to school at Edward R. Murrow High School, which is a public school out by Marine Park. Um, and then I went to college, I did a lot of theater in high school, and then I went to college uh, at Syracuse University, and I got my degree in acting, and I was an actor. Um, and I was an actor after school as well. I was a professional actor for a couple of years. I lived in D.C., I toured with a Shakespeare company for a while, um, and then I moved back to New York, and I, and I hadn't started writing, but the acting was sort of as acting is, like, not consistent, and so sometimes I would be at least like sad and out of work, and sometimes I'd be doing a show, and eventually um, I started writing. I started writing little scenes, and then I started writing plays, and then I started applying to graduate schools just to have a deadline. So like if I applied to graduate school, then I'd have to finish a play that year, because you need to apply to one. <laughs> so that's how I started. and. Um, and then I started taking classes, and that's where I met Hannah. And, you know, the applying to, like, what Hannah was saying about, like, creating the things that you need to create for yourself um, in order to write, in order to um, get to where you want to go, like, that becomes incredibly important when you're not in school and when you don't have someone giving you deadlines. Like, when you don't have something to do. It's important to do the things that will ensure that you sit down and write at your desk, whether it's you know, a poem that day, whether it's some research that you do. Um, and so, I'm, I mean, I'm still in a writing class now. <laughs> um, I take them all the time. Yeah, I do. Um, and have a writer's group and, and do the things that, that get me closer to it. Um, so my family came from the Soviet Union before I was born, and I was born here. Um, my parents and my brother came, and that's where my play came from. It's called Russian Transport. And it was um, produced last season, and it went really well, and um, it's going to be produced in Chicago next next year. Um, and the play sort of grew out. Like, I had been writing, and I, and I finally was like, I think I'm going to... I'm ready to write something that is close to my experience, that comes from the way. Um, is, are there, is there anybody here whose parents are not from this country? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I remember being in, um, in high school and one of my teachers said, oh, who's, who's, who was born here? And of course, you know, a lot of people raised their hands. And then they said, whose parents were born here? And like half the class raised their hands. And then they said, whose grandparents were born here? And there was like one person who raised their hands, because, you know, it's like New York City, so we're all from someplace else, usually. Um, but so I, that, so the, that play, which was like, the, probably was a good, a good big break. That play was a good big break. It was the one that was the closest to me, because it came from who I was and who I knew, and, and um, 
the experience that I had being someone growing up in New York whose parents um, were from Russia and kind of um, was there for the very early part of it, um, which is a little bit about what I want to talk about. It's talking about process. Um, I think a lot of times like you go see a movie or you go see a play or you read a book or you read or you listen to a song and it's and you love it and it sounds really great um, and you don't think about all the effort that went into getting it to that place, to the place where it sounds really great. And I certainly did. And um, and so working on the play for two years, three years, it went through a lot of drafts and it went through a lot of different takes and different incarnations. And a lot of it was like, a lot of it was really hard. <laughs> Because like it's really hard to write something and feel really great about finishing it, and then like taking a week or whatever, and then hearing a reading of it, and you as the writer sitting there and thinking like, that's bad. <laughs> I wrote that and it's not good, and it hurts because you've spent so much time on it. And I think what makes a successful writer is that you're willing to be a little bit hurt and be a little bit upset and then keep working on it and keep making it better and go back to the computer and back to the basics and <coughs> try it a different way because if you think about a painter you know a painter has their canvas and they say well you know like oh maybe green would maybe green is the color that is going to work for this and so they try some green on it and then they step back and they look at it and go oh that didn't work I'm going to take that off and I'm going to try something else. Well, like, as writers, we're doing the same thing. It's just if you write a book or if you write a play or if you write something that's longer, it takes a lot more time, right? You're adding the green into it. You're going to try something new. And then you're going to step back from it and you're going to say, oh, no, that was the wrong color. i got to take that green out and i got to, like, try red. i got to try something else. So that, um, that process of figuring out the play, of, like, figuring out what the story is, who the characters are, what they want, for some people, it's a short process. For some people, it's a long process. For me, it's a long process. For me, it takes several drafts for me to figure out who these people are, what they want, where they are, why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and I would just encourage you to under to know that about your work, to understand. Like, there are going to be times when you sit down and you review it and think, oh, what did I do? I, I thought it was so good when I was writing it. And then, it's not, and, but yet there is something there, and the thing that's there is the thing that I'm going to keep working on, and I'm going to write another draft, and I'm going to write another draft, and I'm going to write another draft. Um, I brought up applying to grad school because Russian Transport is, um, you know, it's, it's being published, it was produced in New York, it had a great production, it's going to be produced in Chicago. It won a great prize. It won, it won the Paula. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, it got me a really great fellowship. I mean, it is, it got me a really great agent. Like, it is probably, like, dream come true type scenario for a first-time play and for a first-time playwright. Um, and there are a lot of writers who maybe have more experience but haven't had that major production yet and haven't had that kind of success yet. But I wanted to share with you, like, when I was working on that play and when it was in its various drafts, I didn't get into grad school with that play. You know, I got uh, rejection letters from like everyone I applied to that year. Um, Han and I were both finalists for some cool stuff, but I didn't get in. And I applied for all these development conferences with that play, and I didn't get in for that play, for Russian Transport. And I <coughs> sent it to some theaters on my own, and I got really lovely rejection letters back. <laughs> were like, well, you're a great writer, but no thanks. And and that process with your creative process are the two things that you're gonna that you're gonna be figuring out like, for the rest of your career. Like, how do I just deal with something not being good or deal with this rejection? Okay, I believe in myself, I believe in what I'm saying, I believe in the work that I'm doing and spending time on. And even though I'm getting all these no's, um, even though I'm having doubts, I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep working on it. Um, that was exactly what I had to hear right now. So. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I mean, just to be clear too, like 
like so that that success has been really great. But with my new play, like I, I you know, I've gotten rejection letters for the new one too, which is still in its early drafts, and I'm still figuring it out and still trying to make it better. And and that you know, it just it's going to move with you. So you just keep doing the work that you believe in, and um, and that. The story, and when you find that story, that story that you, that only you can tell, and that you know has to be out in the world, just stick with it. That's sort of the only way. <laughs> That's great. I would love it right now if we could. Erica brought in two parts of Russian transport: an early draft and then the current draft. Oh, uh, finally, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would love it if we could hear at least some of them side by side. Did yeah. you want to Oh, I do have one, yeah. Erica, did you want to read them, or do you want to? Um, sure. So I think what we should, we should probably do is... I'm I'm just, I've been debating in my head because the first the, I included the very first draft of this scene and I included the very final draft of this scene and the first draft is like totally nonsensical like it makes no sense whatsoever and the final draft is like a scene where things actually happen between people and you understand what's going on so um so I think let's read the final draft and then we'll go back and read the first draft and you can see how much work it took to get it to the final draft so, where does that so that starts on page 7. It says Act 1, Scene 4. Um, so you guys will follow along. I won't read the character names. I'll just read the, the lines. You'll see some of this stuff is in Russian. Um, I don't speak Russian. My parents speak Russian. I never learned it. Um, so I will... Probably read the English. The page are oh, do you see what do you do? You see page eight? It says Sonia at the top. Uh, yes. The page right before that, seven. Um, but where does, where does oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so the setup here is there's a young boy. He's 18. Alex. He's a senior in high school. He's agreed to do some work for his uncle, who's just come from Russia, that he knows is illegal. He thinks that it has to do with drugs. So he's picking up this girl from the airport, and he thinks he's, like, helping her smuggle drugs. Okay, Act 1, Scene 4. Buick Le Sabre, 363. Yeah, that's me. Ah, you are Victor? No, no, I'm just I'm just taking you. Okay, yes. Minha zavut Sonia. Hey, Alex. Hello. Hey. So, um, you got any luggage or anything? Uh, what is? Bagage I guess? I give him to the man. Oh, cool, all right, he bringing in he car. Awesome. So, you're good? I mean, you went to the bathroom and everything, toilet, mignonado. Are you sure? It's just they told me to stop and the drive's like an, they told me not to stop and the drive's like an hour if there's no traffic. I mean, there shouldn't be, but if there's an accident and if you got something like, inside you or whatever. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's uncomfortable, I guess. Are we going or no? Yes, forget it, yes. He drives. Uh, you okay if I turn on the radio? He turns on the radio. You you had a good trip over? Uh, ah, yeah. It's long as hell, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. He turns up the heat. Yeah, I usually keep it pretty cold. It's like refreshing and whatnot. <laughs> we seeing Fifth Avenue? What? Fifth Avenue. Like in the city? Mm, Rockefeller, sex, we see? No, it's not, please. Um, we're actually going to New Jersey. New Jersey? Yeah. Why? I know, right? <laughs> it's nothing is stupid. Uh, we're not driving through Manhattan. Что? It's a near putti. Oh, I wanting to see um, lots, everything I wanting. Fast, fast, fast. Now to see. Sure, yeah. So is this is this your first time in New York? Uh, your first time here? Da, 
cool. All right. Well, I'm gonna drive through Staten Island, so I think you can see the Statue of Liberty. Ah, yes. Okay. Wow. I'll let you know when we're passing it. It actually looks really small from there. Uh, I don't know how like impressive it'll be. You know, it's funny when you go inside. Like they used to let you go to the top before 9/11. 9/11. Yes, I know. Yeah. So I mean. <coughs> I went with school when I was a kid, and it takes forever. The line moves crazy slow, but the whole time you're like, oh man, I'm gonna get to look out the Statue of Liberty. But then you get to the top, and it's just like a dirty window. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, don't be disappointed if you see it and you're not like taking a pack or whatever. It probably happens a lot. Mm, I'm sorry, I know understanding. Uh, yes, because you tip it like that. Statue of Liberty? Yeah, I'll let you know. Okay. Oh, I can ask you. Uh, can I pull out my passport? Huh? I would like, please. Um, I don't like have your passport. Oh, Victor has? I guess. Maybe. Like, maybe you give him the stuff and he gives you your passport or something. I don't know. I'm not normally, like, international. Like, you know when people say buy local? That's me. I'm for local business. It's really big now. Uh, I know, understand. Man, you really gotta learn some English. Zuchita Angliski. I learning. Good. It's like a universal language. They speak it everywhere. They speak it in like India, France, everywhere. He's important for business. Oh, for you, no doubt. I mean, you probably travel a lot, like with the whole. Also, I learning Italian a little bit. Okay, I guess that would be helpful in like Italy. <laughs> you want hearing what I know? Sure, lay it out. Queste sono la mia foto. Shit. What's that mean? This is my pictures. This is my pictures. Man, you gotta learn how to say, like, where's the bathroom? <laughs> like, I don't know, someone's actually gonna help you out. Zuchitva's Niboche. This important for model. Oh, yeah, what are you, a model? Of course. Okay. I like, I like. You can make. She motions for him to turn up the radio. Uh, yeah. She, my best. Selena Gomez, I love. Love, love, love. Yeah, she's, um. So, are you gonna do that here? Doing? Modeling or whatever? I'm uh, hoping, yes, very much I'm hoping. Uh huh. They tell me it will be a lot of work for me now, so who told you? A man from model agency who's sending me here. He discovered all big time Russian models. And before, he working with Heidi Klum. Shit. Wow, this is East River, yes? No, it's Jamaica Bay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Driving. Sonia, um, uh, how old are you? Mm -hmm. To be a school collect. Uh, numbers is hard for me. Just tell me in Russian. Did not sit. Oh shit. Hey, you telling me we're seeing something, okay? Something special? I will. It's a pretty boring drive, but I will, sure. Thank you. Uh, you warm enough? Mm hmm Good. Let's get it. Um <laughs> So did you guys feel like you knew like what did you think was going on in that scene? Anything. I mean, and anything is, yeah. This general miscommunication with two people who know two different languages. Uh-huh, definitely. And there's just like, like when someone whose uh, native song is not English, they speak very blocky uh -huh. they do speak English. Mm -hmm. So it's always funny to listen to. Yep, mm -hmm. yep, yeah. 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 <laughs> but you got that, like he he went into the scene thinking one thing, and then and then he was talking to her, and then by the end of the scene, he realized that something else was happening. Um, yeah. So just to give you guys an idea of process, we're gonna read the first draft, the first draft I ever wrote of that scene, like before I before I wrote the end of the play, and I'll read it now. <laughs> and everything in bold, I didn't, this is before I had it translated, so everything in bold is, is, would, would eventually be in Russian, but I never got to the point of translating this draft. Darkness, fog, Alex lays on the air mattress in the middle of the stage, there's quiet, almost like a vacuum, a car door slams, a light finds the actress playing mirror, her skin is bright white under the lights, she holds a position of a sculpture model, one shoulder higher than the other, her face in profile, Alex breathes heavily. For a moment, this is all we see in here. Static image of breath. We have Sephora now. Now we go to Sephora and I buy good cosmetics. I buy a red lipstick, which is the fashion. In Italian Vogue, the models wear lipstick this season. 
for vintage look, also in French book. These are the best book. I only get French book and Italian book. There's, <clears throat> there's a stop, first stop on the throughway. We're gonna, you see my comp card? It's professional, it's professional look. When I go upstate, like when I used to, I used to go more when they got outlets. They got a track, but far, it's like in Saratoga. When I used to go, we always stop there. Uh, we always stop here. They got a Wendy's, they got a Starbucks. You want a latte? Sound of the car on the highway. Headlights pass over them, moments pass. You have Starbucks? Of course, we have everything. We have Starbucks, McDonald's, Taco Bell, but I don't eat such things. When I was little, I ate more. It's very unhealthy. I eat only healthy things now. I do Pilates, I do also yoga. How old are you? I did a master cleanse before my pictures and also now. You know English? Yes, I have medium English, also French, which is better, cosmopolitan. In, you, in school you learn? In school, on location, I work many places. I work Belarus, one time I work St. Petersburg, one time I work Denmark. We do balloon, hot air balloon, hot air balloon, hot air balloon, hot air balloon. Denmark is nice, also cosmopolitan. You travel too because of scouting? No, no. Um, I've been, since we came to America, I've been to Florida, and I have falls, also a lot on the East Coast, like all the East Coast places I've been, like Philadelphia, Boston. You live in New York City? Uh-huh. I love this. I want to live in Manhattan. It's the best. Um, how you got here? What? You met someone? I need Scout. You know Yuri Sergeyev? No. He work in your company. He is important for you. You know the face? Maybe. He is see me. You see my comp car? Maybe. I am amazing photogenic. You have camera? I have an iPhone. It's picture phone? Yes. It's got pictures and music and internet. You got one? No. They're good. Do you have to go to the bathroom? No. Oh. I shouldn't tell you about iPhones. It's AT&T. We do Verizon exclusive. The company? Um, yeah, but I don't really like the Blackberry. iPhones are sleek. Company is Verizon? Yeah. They took my phone because I'm supposed to get a special company phone. Do you have a phone for me? They say only smartphones are allowed. I don't have a smartphone. Do you have one for me? Um, I don't know. Maybe when we, I don't know, pause driving. There might be a phone when we get there, I guess. You can take pictures? Yeah. So take of me. Oh, it's not good quality. Low pixels. I am amazing photogenic. Amber Valletta, she wants to book a job from a photo in her passport. Take. Okay. I think it's coming up. You hungry? I am master class. Take. Okay. He holds up his phone. The girl shifts into a coquettish model pose. He takes the picture. Good, yes? Yeah. I am classic feature. You have a girlfriend? I got a few. I got a few. <laughs> model? No, in Brooklyn. One who's older. She's like 23. She's in Brooklyn College. She a big shot? Not really. No. You got a boyfriend? Boys are a distraction from career. I am focused model. I can call my mother from your phone, she is always worrying, she is always stressing out. You know stressing? Stressing out? Yeah. Also my mother, you know bugging? No, she's bugging out, she's wigging out. Wigging out. My mother is wigging out. Can I phone my mother? She is wigging out. I'm not supposed to... Long distance, no? Can I owe you? How much does it cost? The car pulls over. Alex gets off the mattress, walks over to the girl, he bends down. You're gonna get a coffee and also like a hamburger or whatever. I'm gonna wait here like 20 minutes, okay? Fast call, fast call for mama voicemail. Listen to me, listen to me. Inside is like a stand, there's a woman. They got police sometimes. Sometimes like state trooper stuff or food or whatever. Go in and say you need help. Say you have money, you gotta talk to the police. Police is bad, not here, not upstate. Not when you're in upstate, the police is good, okay? Takes out his phone. I'm gonna take one more, okay, for the records. Also, I have comp card. She starts to strike another model pose, but Alex puts his hand on Alex puts his hand on her shoulder. No, I just want to play him on this time. Smile like a regular smile. She gets a little shy. He looks down, takes a picture. That's the best one. I am fresh face. He looks at her. This is not what you think it is. Go inside. Call your mother. Ask her to help you. I'm here for print work. I just want to help you. Okay, trust me. You trust me. This is top model agency. Go inside and call your mother. I'm serious. Go. Alex stands. He looks down at the girl. She looks at him. Carter slams blackout. So I feel like I brought this in because I think it's really clear that a lot can change from your first draft to your final draft. And as you keep working and as you keep figuring out what the play is, what the piece needs, it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. Um, and all that takes time, you know, all that takes sitting down and just writing a lot of drafts. And, and did you guys have any observations? Like, did, like when you read the two back to back, does anything jump out at you? 
You can say one's bad. I don't care. I, I agree. <laughs> Well, when I, generally when I start, I have like one kind of big idea, and this was about a family who, the uncle comes from Russia to come stay with them for a while while he gets on his feet, and that I knew that the son would become involved in a human trafficking ring, like he'd get drawn into it, and that's all I knew. I didn't know how, I didn't know why, I didn't know what would happen, I didn't really know the other characters, um, I mean, I kind of knew it. It's followed a similar template to my family in that, you know, mom and dad, older brother, younger sister. But that's all I knew. And personally, as everyone's going to say this to you as you keep writing, that, that everybody's process is different. You know, some people outline. Some people, like, before they write a play, they're like, this is what it, this is, what it is. This is what's going to happen. These are the characters. This is what they want. That, I don't do that. I don't do that at the beginning. Sometimes I try and do that later. Sometimes I go back and forth. But I usually find the play by writing the play several, several times. My new play is about a young man that comes to this country. Um, and he's from the Ivory Coast. And he goes to high school in America. And he is a former child soldier, which is another big world issue. But like. That's all I knew about it when I started writing the play. And, you know, to make something interesting for two hours is really hard, and that is that it takes you just figuring things out, answering questions, and coming up against roadblocks and being like, oh god, how do I solve that? And solving it. And you will. I mean, you will solve it. You know? Could I ask you to talk a little bit about place? Because it's funny, like, even though these two drafts they both take place in a car. The the like done draft feels much more like it's in a car yeah. to me. Yeah, and that uh, it's part of the reason I brought this in. And the site, like the the specificity of your location, that's something that is so important to me and generally comes in a little bit later in my process, right? So like I write the conflict. And usually, I, that's why my early drafts are so bad, because it's usually like five people yelling at each other for two hours, <laughs> and they have a fight. And then that's how I figure out, oh, what are they fighting about? You know, what are they disagreeing about? Then a little bit later on in the process, and this is when the scene starts to get better, I start thinking, oh, they're in an office. What are they doing in their office today? You know, like in this scene, the thing that helped me so much was when I was finally like, they're in a car. What do you do in a car? You listen to the radio. You talk about the song on the radio. You say, can we stop for something? All those, is it too hot for you? Can I turn on, is it too cold for you? I'm going to turn on the heat. Those are all, those are all ways in which the location helps move the scene forward. Because think about it. Usually, like think about that conflict that you wrote down. Usually, when you ha are having a fight with someone, you don't generally like walk into a room to have a fight with someone, right? You're like, I came into this room to do this other thing, and then the other person wants something, and I don't want to do that. I want to do this other thing I came in here to do. And so like the scene is, you know, some of the tension in the scene lies between, between the conflict and between people trying to get on with what they came into the room to do, like make a smoothie or like... Um, or like in this scene, we're going for a car ride, and we're having this conversation. It's great. Yeah. Um, I, yes. Did you have people read your draft? No. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Because that really, that, like, having other people with different experiences, different points of view, could really help your writing, you know, make their suggestions. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, in playwriting, playwriting is like very much a collaborative art. But even like I think like my husband writes fiction, and even um, or poetry, like even 
if you do something more solitary, like generally there are writers groups and like you have the people that you bring the draft to. Playwriting even more so because as many characters as you have, that's as many people you have in the room plus a director. Sometimes you have like a dramaturg who's there just like to do, to give you notes on the script. The play went through a lot of development. Um, the, yeah, there were a lot of people along the process. And, and if you do write plays, one thing that you're eventually going to learn and going to have to learn is like listening to the criticism, ignoring some of the criticism, which is not good, but trying to pick out what is good, and <laughs> trying to like figure out what the play needs, because know that when people give you criticism, they might not be right. Or they might be giving you criticism for something and that's not the actual problem in the play, if that makes sense. So like, it's like if, like if a doctor is like, oh, no, you're your arm is broken and you have to take off the arm and you're you know you you take a couple of days and you go I, you know I don't think it's broken I think I just have a rash well the fact that he made you like pay attention to your arm was great so like if, if he makes you pay attention to something in the scene that's not working good. if he makes you pay attention to a scene that's not working great but he was wrong about it being broken you know you're the one who has to go back in there and say oh no it's not broken this other little thing is not working. This is the thing I have to fix, and then he won't think it's broken anymore because it'll it'll work just fine. So that there, and that's you know that's something that I think is going to be a lifelong process, especially if you end up writing for television, for film, for things in which there are going to be a lot of voices, a lot of people giving you a lot of feedback. Um, I think that's like part of your journey as the writer is believing in yourself, listening to other people being willing to keep working and keep fixing things, but also knowing when, wait, that's not a good note. I don't, I shouldn't listen to that. Or I should only listen to part of that. I would love to open it up for anyone else who would like to ask Erica something. I have more to ask her, but I want to make sure we get, yes. Um, you mentioned sex specifics. When you write, do you take into consideration the production and how many Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, um, with this play, what was interesting is that I wrote it and it had like three, it had like the car scenes, which was just like theatrical and separate, and it had three locations, a, a dining room, an office, and um, a bedroom. And then when, I, when the show got produced, it was with a company that thankfully had resources and they said, oh, we want to we do it like, we want to build a two-story set and we want to put it all in the same location. And so it was a great idea. I didn't write it with that intended because in my mind I was like, oh, no one's going to build a two-story set for my first play. Like, I just need to set it where all you need is a desk. So I think um, I don't go into it necessarily thinking about that, but I think it's, um, I think it's, it's, I think especially in the beginning of your, of your play, like in the first draft, don't, I wouldn't think about, oh no, are people going to be able to do this? Just write about like what you need to write about, and then I feel like later on, you know, that's when, like I'm working on a play now where I realize like, oh, you, you put a new location in the final scene, and like, I don't know, maybe you don't do that, like maybe, maybe for the sake of continuity, I don't know if that works considering you only have three other locations and yada yada yada, I feel like the logistical stuff, like, is this the right thing to do? Worry about it later, because there are going to be so many people who are going to be like, you can't do that. And you're going to be like, you'll figure it out. <laughs> so. Yes. I think Alice. the uh, humor mm -hmm. that you introduce is a major part mm -hmm. of showing up the characters and what the difference of understanding is. Yeah. And Without it, it would have not been the same. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, and that's like something that you can do, like once you figure out what the conflict is, I feel like the humor stuff can kind of naturally find its way back into it. Because yeah. most of the time people don't want to get into a fight, right? Like most of the time we try and do everything we can to not get into a fight, and it's kind of funny to watch people 
who really want to be fighting but are like really trying not to be fighting. And so that, yeah. Thank you. Are there any mentees that would like to ask anything? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously Loud and proud. Um, the dialogue, you know how it is for everything? Um, I've noticed like in the first draft, it was kind of like chopping in there and like, like in the second, like final, like it's so cool, like way to talk. Like how would you transition from like one to one? Well, um, yeah, I think one thing that really helps is eventually I get to the point where I know what the character wants and that really helps because before I get to that point then I'm just letting them talk but when they want when when they have a really specific thing like can we stop because I really want to see Saks Fifth Avenue you know then and he can say no and she can say I'm, I don't understand what you're saying like then they're sort of having a real conversation um, before I know what is happening in the scene, then they're just like, <laughs> and that's why the dialogue's so choppy because I'm literally sitting at my computer usually like, <laughs> I don't know what comes next, like let's, let's talk about Taco Bell, I don't know. Um, and then much later on I'm like, oh, okay, I know exactly where he's going, I know where he's coming from, I know, I know the end of the play already so I know where they're getting to. What do I need to do in this scene that's going to allow us to move forward and get to the end in like a really great way? So yeah, I mean, it's just like, it's funny because there's a second scene with another girl in the second act where, that I wrote years after I wrote this, where like the whole scene is she just asks him if she, she's a little panicked, she's a little scared of the car, and she says, can I use your phone? And he's like, and then they have like a funny conversation about like curse words in different languages and she ends up feeling better but like that idea can I use your phone I mean it's in this first one you know it just didn't it just like wasn't good or it wasn't a conversation it was just an idea and then further along in the process it became a scene like a real scene where someone wants something someone says no but we could still have a The play is called Russian Transport. And you can I can I that you like I wasn't I wasn't like a fan of this at the first final draft. I wasn't thinking of a human trafficking at all. Good. So there's it it was nice. Good. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Um, so how do you deal with like the limitations of, you know, theater versus like a movie? Um, where you you can't flip from scene to scene really quickly. Um, and you know you can't be in extravagant locations, um, and you can't have like too many characters on a stage. How do you how do you deal with that? Well, I'm at this point I'm sort of like working on both and like dabbling in both, and it is really interesting. And I think I think for theater, you guys are really I have to say you're very lucky because you grew up in New York City, and so maybe you don't. I feel like that's not something I realized when I was uh, younger, how much theater I saw just like in high school and college and growing up here because once you like see theater for 10 years, for 15 years, like you understand things about it that you don't even know you understand. And I think with theater, when you understand its limitations and you use those limitations in a really exciting way, like that can make so the play I'm doing, I'm writing right now, there, it's, um, it's a high school play, there are a couple of different locations, and there are locations that are flashbacks to, um, to the Ivory Coast in West Africa. And it happens like during a basketball game, where all of a sudden things get loud and everything gets crazy and now we're in the past and we're in Cote d'Ivoire. And that's, that is such an exciting moment, and a lot about the play doesn't work now, but that moment works so well. And Every time I have a reading, every time I have a workshop, people are like, I love that moment. But why, right? Like, we didn't cut to, we didn't cut to Africa. We didn't, like, now it's, you know, there's no scene change. It's using the limitation of we're in one space. This space is going to be every space. How can I creatively come up with a way that excites the audience to embrace that? Shakespeare's, like, great with that, right? Because he had this one theater and, and that they were two theaters that they worked in. And in the beginning of Henry V, 
one of the characters comes out for the prologue and he says, I'm going to paraphrase, <laughs> but he says, guys, <laughs> totally everyone, imagine that this stage is a battlefield. Imagine that these actors you see represent thousands of people. And the great thing about theater is that an audience will. They'll do that. You as the writer need to create a situation where the audience can say, I know we haven't gone anywhere, but we're in Africa right now. I know we are. I know we are. Nothing changed. You know, like, nobody cut to, there was no film projection, but I know we are, and I'm excited because I figured it out. So I would say embrace those limitations. Yeah. We have time for a couple more. Yeah. Yeah, um, when I started writing that character, I thought he reminded me a lot of my cousin. Um, there's maybe like a little bit of my brother in him, but my cousin worked at a cell phone store when we were in college and high school, and he ended up taking over his dad's. Um, he's an electrician, he works with his dad. And that's where that character grew out of, and, and actually like all these characters, I think grew out of really specific people in my life, which is great. And then it was like a jumping off point. And then they became who they became through working on them. And now Alex, I wouldn't say he's like my cousin Tommy, but he's, you know, that's where I start. So I think it's nice to draw on people and then feel totally free to be like, okay, but, this, but the play needs them to be this. So it's great that they're this other thing in real life, but right now the play needs this, so I gotta go there. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, I've talked about how hard it is to write plays and stick with something for two years or three years. Um, and for me, if I'm going to stick with it for that long, it needs to be something that I really care about. And so I knew I didn't just want to, not just because there are plenty of great plays about families, but like I just thought if I'm not writing about something big that I care about, like human trafficking, like child soldiers, then the chances that I'd stop writing at some point, like after a year or after two years, after, you know, 14 months or whatever, when I was feeling really disheartened, um, would be a lot greater. But if I feel like this is a really important story and I haven't seen this story on stage yet in a way that has moved me and that I wanted to be at, that's what like keeps me going towards the final draft. So I would say, you know, some people say write what you know. Yeah, do. I mean, write what you know. But you know, more important than that, write what you care about. That's a wonderful place to end things. Erica, thank you so much. Thank wow. you.